So far, we have seen chi-squared tests used to test for association between two categorical explanatory variables. This next section talks about using a chi-squared test to look at whether a proposed model is a good fit for the data. Instead of being an extension of a two-sample z-test for comparing proportions, this is more like an extension of the one-sample z-test for proportions. So in practice, the chi-squared test is really used for a variety of hypotheses about categorical variables. In this case, we have one categorical variable of interest. So we're not interested in whether uh, two variables are associated. We really want to know whether a specified model is a good fit. Let's look at an example. In his book, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell suggests that a hockey player's birth month has a big influence on his chance to make it to the highest levels of the game. To see if birth date is related to success, a random sample of 80 NHL players from the 2009-2010 season was selected and their birthdays were recorded. Overall, 32 of those 80 players were born in the first quarter of the year, 20 in the second quarter, 16 in the third quarter, and 12 in the fourth quarter. Do these data provide convincing evidence that the birthdays of NHL, that is, the highest level of the game, the birthdays of NHL players are not uniformly distributed throughout the year? So, if there were, uh, uh, if hockey players' birthdays were uniformly distributed, then we would see the, an equal chance of having a high-level player born in any of the four quarters. So our hypotheses would be that there is no change in the probability from quarter one to quarter two to quarter three to quarter four for when we select a hockey player. But there is only one variable, the variable being birth quarter. That is when a hockey player is born. So this is our response variable. That is what time of the year is a hockey player born? They're either born in quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, or quarter four. There are four levels, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. When we did a one sample z-test for proportions before, there had to just be two possible outcomes. We had the helpers and hinderers example in that case, and there were two outcomes, a helper or a hinderer, and we thought about that as success and failure. Now we have four possible outcomes, and we care about each of those four outcomes, so we can't make it a success-failure decision. So really we care about each of those four possible outcomes. We care is probability of that first quarter the same as the probability of the second as the third and of the fourth. Are all four quarters equally likely in terms of the probability of a hockey player at the professional level being born? Oops, so that should be 0.25. This is saying that pi 1 is 0.25, pi 2 is 0.25, pi 3 and pi 4 are also 0.25. That is, there's a 25% chance of a hockey player at the professional level having been born in any of the four quarters of the year. The alternative hypothesis is that the model doesn't fit good. The model being that we have a uniform distribution of players uh, throughout the year in terms of their birth dates. The alternative is that this model doesn't fit good. And we're going to use that bad grammar because this is called a goodness of fit test. We want to know how good is this model in terms of fitting our data. And if the model doesn't fit good, that means at least one of these proportions, or at least one of these probabilities, is a bad fit. So that is at least one category or at least one category's probability is in violation of the model.
this is similar to what we would do for one-way ANOVA. This is similar to what we would do for multiple regression. When we have multiple parameters specified in our null hypothesis, to make the null hypothesis incorrect, just one of those parameters has to be wrong. So in this case, at least one of these pi's, at least one of these probabilities, has to be different than what the model specifies. So at least one category is in violation or is different than what we have specified in the null hypothesis. So all of these probabilities don't have to be different than 0.25, just at least one of them does. In order for to use this goodness of fit test, we have several assumptions that we have to check and several uh, conditions for this to be valid. So first off, we have to have a random sample, and that by this point in the semester should be no surprise. And this has been satisfied because we see that we have a random sample of 80 players from the NFL. So we're good here. We also have to have a categorical response variable. This has also been satisfied. We're only looking at when in the year a player was born. That is, what is the birth quarter? So quarter when player was born. So this is also satisfied. We're not looking at year, we're not looking at age, we're not looking at anything like that. We just care when they were born. Notice this is just one variable. We're not looking at association, we're just looking at the breakup the categories for this one variable and do the categories or the probabilities for these categories follow a certain model. So for a goodness of fit test there is one variable and that's how we can tell the goodness of fit test from the test for independence. For independence two variables are needed for them to be independent or associated with one another. For the goodness of fit test we have to have exactly one variable. The last condition is similar to what we saw for the test of independence, and that is we still have to have at least five expected counts, but this is based on what the model predicts, and this is going to be per category. And we find that using n times pi 1, n times pi 2, n times pi 3, and so on. So in this case, we have n equals 80 subjects in our study. Pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, and pi 4 are all 0.25 if the null model is true. So we're going to do 80 times 0.25, and that equals 20. So this is satisfied, because we have expected 20 players in each of categories or each of quarters 1, 2, 3, and 4 because 0.25 is the predicted proportion for each of quarters 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we have more than five expected counts for each quarter or for each category. Those are the only three assumptions and they are familiar from what we've seen, seen before. We have to have a random sample, we have to have a categorical response that defines our category. So which quarter was each player born in? and we have to have at least five expected counts per category. And again, our categories in this case are the quarters. Then we find our test statistic. And our test statistic, because this is a chi-squared test, is going to be chi-squared OBS. And the good news is it's found the exact same way we found our chi-squared test statistic before. It is our observed counts minus our expected counts squared for each category divided by the expected counts in each category and we sum that up over the categories. In this case, there are four quarters, so we're going to have four terms in our sum. If we look back up here again, in the first quarter, there were 32 observations. In the second quarter, there were 20 observations. In the third quarter, there were 16 observations. And in the fourth quarter, there were 12 observations. So our observed counts are 32, 20, 16, and 12 respectively. The expected counts are 20 for each of the quarters. And so we have enough information to find our test statistic. The first term is going to be 32 minus 20 squared over 20. The second term is going to be 20 minus 20 squared over 20. The third term is going to be 16 minus 20 over 
uh, squared over 20. And then the last term is going to be 12 minus 20 squared over 20. The 32, the 20, the 16, and the 12 are the observed counts that we were given in the problem setup. When we work all of this out, our chi-squared test statistic is 11.2. Our degrees of freedom are based on the number of free pieces of information. We know that there are a total of 80 people uh, born, or excuse me, 80 people in our sample. Um, and so we know that if we have 32 people in the first category, 20 people in the second category, and 16 people in the third category, well that fourth category has to be 12 because we know that they have to sum up to 80. Or we can think about it this way. If we know that there is a total probability of 100% and the first probability is 25, the second probability is 25, and the third probability is 25, that fourth probability has to be 25% because we know it has to sum up to 100. So with four categories, there are only three degrees of freedom. That fourth category is determined by whatever those first three pieces are. So for a chi-squared test of goodness of fit, the degrees of freedom is the number of categories minus one. In this case, k is the number of categories. So we're going to have 4 minus 1 equals 3 degrees of freedom for this test. So looking at this, we have 11.2 for our test statistic and 3 degrees of freedom. And the rule for our test holds from what we saw for our test of independence. Is 11.2 bigger than our degrees of freedom? And is it much bigger than our degrees of freedom? If we think about what a chi-squared distribution looks like that has three degrees of freedom, it's going to look something like this. We've got one, two, I'm not drawing my axes very well. So we've got one, two, three, four, something like that. And we have an observation that's all the way up here at 11.2. And remember the mean when we have three degrees of freedom is three. So we've observed an observation that's pretty high up and it's not going to have a lot of probability greater than it. So these are all the possible chi-squared values that we could get if the null hypothesis is true, if there really is a uniform distribution of uh, uh, birds throughout the four quarters of the year. And so what we've observed is something that's pretty unusual. And in fact, our p-value is something like 0 0.01. This, this is because our observed differences, especially at quarter one and quarter four, are pretty big. So there are some big effects. That is big differences between what we observed and what we expected in terms of the number of players born in each quarter. giving a large overall chi-squared statistic and small p-value. Altogether, this means there is strong evidence against the null hypothesis. that hockey player birds are uniformly distributed
throughout the year. Looking at each of these individual components, what would you say? It looks like more players are born at the beginning of the year. than expected, and fewer at the end of the year than expected. Why can we say that? Well, 32 is more than we would expect if there were a uniform distribution. We would only expect 20, and 32 is much larger than 20. This particular contribution to our chi-squared statistic is very large. Similarly, 12 is much smaller than 20. So 12 is fewer than we would expect if there were a, if there were a uniform distribution of player births throughout the year. This contribution to our chi-squared statistic from quarter four is also a large contribution. So Q1 and Q4, quarter one and quarter four, are the two biggest drivers of why our chi-squared statistic is so big. So that's how we would look at um, our chi-squared test statistic, or our chi-squared test for goodness of fit. We would look at the overall test statistic, and we would look at the p-value to look at where that, uh, to look at whether we have strong evidence. But then we would look at the individual contributions, and specifically the difference in the numerator and the direction of that difference, to see what might be driving that strong evidence.